Thank you so much for joining us for Afghanistan's future, development, the state, and the humanitarian challenge. This is the 11th in the series, the Yale Development Dialogues, which are virtual panel discussions hosted by Yale's Economic Growth Center, Jackson Institute for Global Affairs, and History Department. I'm Catherine Cheney. I'm a senior reporter at DevEx focused on technology and innovation and global development, and I'm thrilled to moderate this series. The Yale Development Dialogues, for those of you who aren't familiar, brings together perspectives from history, economics, and policy to discuss ways to address challenges facing low and middle income countries. And today we're joined by experts who have been at the forefront of policy in Afghanistan over the past two decades. So I have a number of questions I'd like to ask them, but for those of you joining us here live on the Zoom webinar, we really encourage you to submit your questions via the Q&A function. So keep those coming throughout and I'll get to them as soon as I can. So transitioning to the topic we're discussing today, the American withdrawal from Afghanistan left the international community uncertain, not only in terms of the future of the country and its people, women and girls in particular, but also the future of intervention. So today we'll be asking questions like, how does the situation in Afghanistan fit into a history of many failed and some productive interventions? What should the priorities of the international development community be as they interact with the country now, especially as the country faces a real humanitarian crisis? And what does the future hold for the reconstruction of Afghanistan and its relationship with the same foreign powers who were previously invaders? So joining us to discuss these questions and more, we're thrilled to be joined by Dr. Orzala Neymat, an Afghan scholar and think tank leader, who is research associate at the Department of Development Studies, which is part of the School of Oriental and African Studies in the UK. Khalid Payenda, who served as the last Minister of Finance in the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, leading an ambitious portfolio of economic reforms and anti-corruption initiatives until his resignation in August, 2021 and Rory Stewart, senior fellow at Yale's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs, who served as the UK Secretary of State for International Development. His work focuses on contemporary politics in crisis and on international development and intervention in fragile and conflict-affected states, and he's written extensively on Afghanistan. Rory is also co-organizer of this event, the Yale Development Dialogue Series, um, and he's spent a lot of time in Afghanistan from his solo walk across the country in 2002, to his work starting and running the Turquoise Mountain Foundation, to his role uh, in, in government in the UK. And Rory, I know you've been involved in a number of conversations on Afghanistan recently. I've reviewed many of them in preparation for this discussion. So I mentioned earlier, the Yale Development Dialogues is unique in terms of the interdisciplinary perspectives we bring together. So I'd love to hear what are some of your thoughts and goals for this particular conversation? What can our audience expect? Thank you very, very much indeed. And it's it's great to be here and, and a great privilege to be with my two Afghan colleagues um, who I hope are gonna be doing the majority of the talking. Let, let me just try to frame it slightly from a Yale University point of view in the history of international development. So, Afghanistan is both a very exceptional situation, but also one that connects to a much, much broader, longer history. So in terms of exception, people will think about it as a military intervention, but it was also one of the largest development, international development and humanitarian exercises of the last 20 years. This was a country in which the international community didn't only deploy uh, nearly a million military personnel over the period, but hundreds of thousands of civilians who worked with Afghan partners on almost every dimension of economic development, on human rights, on civil society, on schooling, on health, with absolutely unparalleled levels of investment. Now, as with any of these situations, it is possible to criticize a lot of that investment, of course, much of the money which was spent by the international community in Afghanistan ended up finding its way back to the West through strange contracts. There was also, of course, a lot of corruption. Nevertheless, there are very, very few countries in the world over the last 20 years where quite so much was invested. And there was a very, very ambitious idea on remodeling a society. So it gives us an opportunity to see what, with all the ideas of the West, all the technology of the West, all the money of the West, what was and was not achieved over a 20 year period and how that compares to the way we thought about international development from the 1950s onwards. 
And now, of course, we find ourselves in a new challenge, which is the Taliban government has taken over. People are trying to put pressure on the Taliban government and use development and humanitarian assistance as leverage potentially over the Taliban government at a time when there is an extreme humanitarian crisis and Afghans are now facing starvation in some parts of the country. So it then raises a second series of questions on the way in which we think about international development in the future. So on that, I'm, I'm going to step aside for a bit um, and maybe hand back to my Afghan colleagues to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Rory. And I apologize for some background noise, unavoidable background noise on my end here that will hopefully subside shortly. Um, but one of the things that Khaled mentioned in preparation for this call was the importance of beginning our conversation with what was achieved. While we're tasked with talking about the future, it is important to highlight what the 20 year intervention achieved. So I wonder if you could expand on, the, on that point. Uh, thank you very much. It's uh... Uh, privilege to be to be here. Uh, greetings to to the esteemed panelists and also the moderator and and the participants who have joined us online. Um, I wouldn't spend a lot of time. I think we've already beautifully covered a part of it. You know, unprecedented amount of aid flowing into a country, but it also achieved a lot. And the wake of the tragedy that we've seen uh, over the last ninety days, it's difficult. It's uh, difficult to, to, to get a perspective of 20 years, but a lot was achieved, you know, going from a, a, a GDP per capita of below uh, $200 to tripling it over uh, the first decade and a half, having 9 million children go back to school, you know, more than uh, 30, 35% of them uh, girls, uh, improvements on other socioeconomic uh, indicators, you know, plummeting um, maternal mor mortality numbers, which were the worst in, in the world, uh, building institutions that were still people complaining about, but uh, providing some service deliveries, you know, people making uh, a nine, 10 hour trip all the way to the border to Pakistan just to make a call to a relative in the US or in, 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 in the West could now have social media and tele, uh, telecommunication, you know, and uh, mobile at their fingertips. Uh, Afghanistan connected with multiple flights a day uh, flying out, out of Kabul. A lot of key infrastructure um, built that enabled integration of the country better, but also enabled better uh, regional connectivity had it been for better relationships with the, uh, with the neighbors that, uh, key infrastructure could have done even much more. So a lot was achieved. It's uh, uh, obviously with the amount of money flowing, with little uh, accountability, with systems that were to be built, obviously there were misuse and uh, with sometimes unfortunately with good intentions, wastages that could have been avoided, but a lot was achieved. I say this and I want it uh, for us to start uh, with, because in 2001, we s faced a similar situation. I think it's uh, it's an incredibly, incredibly difficult people for the whole nation. nation. But uh, keeping a long-term perspective helps, you know, uh, having the faith and that things could, could be better. I'll stop here. Absolutely. No, I appreciate you, um, you know, starting us off with that, that important perspective. And Zooming in on one example of progress, uh, Orsala, I know you have over two decades of experience in development practice and promoting women's rights in war affected societies. So I wonder if you can expand on the gains for Afghan women and girls over the past two decades. Um, and then we can talk about where we are now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Catherine. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to be part of this distinguished panel and uh, joining uh, Rory and uh, Khaled and yourself into this uh, discussion, very crucial and timely, I would say. Um, with regards to uh, gains of the last 20 years, uh, before even starting to talk about gains, we have to sort of keep in mind that the gains come with a lot of troubles as well. Uh, 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 generally speaking, and specifically with regards to women. So I just sort of, divide the gains in terms of social, political, and economic. 
and very briefly run through all of it, just for us, for our sort of memories to remind ourselves of what has been the changes. In the social field, uh, what we see uh, uh, have been achieved is um, massive and, excuse me, there was an annoying sound. I hope you now don't hear it. My notebook was going somewhere. <laughs> My oh, apologies. Oh. <laughs> uh, I hope now it's clearer. <laughs> Um, so in terms of social gains, what, I'm like, what I'd like to highlight is this change in people, particularly generally in Afghanistan and rural Afghanistan, in terms of people's behaviors towards women's rights, women's position in the society. Uh, there has been some unprecedented level of achievements in the rural and community development side of things. In some communities and in some areas that I have gone to, because of my own research on local power relations and local governance, I find out that for the first time in the history of these areas, the state and the donors have reached there not to extract, but to deliver. So this is something that we cannot deny. Nobody, including the Taliban, cannot deny the, the, the impact of the community development and the role of women in the community development programs. The conditionality that was set up has been a game changer. Now, having said that, in terms of social behavioral change has happened, we see a thirst for education. We see the thirst for education across the country, across generations, across gender. There is a pin pad campaign by volunteers from the Southern Afghanistan running around with the men that in, a, in appearance to all internationals look like a Taliban, no different from a Taliban, long beard, big turban, having this, uh, a paper, a, a placard in their hand and says, open the schools for girls. So that's something that has a message for everyone, particularly for those who are ruling the country now. The political gains, although in many aspects quite symbolic, but has been also important. We have had in the constitution 25% quotas, but a lot of women made it beyond that quota in the provincial and provincial council and uh, parliamentary elections. So the symbolic part aside in the political reason, some of the behaviors of the politicians using instrumentally women position was there, but women themselves have created an, an identity for, for themselves to be very particular not necessarily representing themselves as the representatives of the Western values or Eastern values or anything very, very pure, very traditional, but at the same time, very aware and conscious of their rights. I think these are critical. And just very quickly, I know I've gone beyond my two minutes, but just very quickly in terms of economic gains mm -hmm. as well, in the room, we have to remember 70% of Afghan population lives in rural areas, but the economic gains has also been quite significant in the rural context where women were able to access market, sell their products to the level possible, obviously, and I'm just worried what will happen to it now. Women were able to, make, to be involved in businesses, small, medium, and larger scales, more in the small and medium range less in the larger because of, of course, the men that are trying to sort of um, maneuver more over them. So overall, in all these different sort of uh, areas, there has been quite significant gains that we cannot deny it. And that's something that with the crisis that is happening now, may be affected. Maybe we will see the different levels and maybe we'll see some changes, but there will not be a kind of a dragging to the zero point again. That's my sort of bit of an optimism optimism in, in terms of moving uh, way forward. Thanks. Thank you. Rory, please jump in. Uh, a, a, couple, a couple of quick things. I mean, I think the first thing to understand is that the story in Afghanistan is uneven depending about which part of the country you're talking about. So in many ways, there was huge progress, not, not just in urban areas, obviously in places that the, the cities, but also in places like the Bamiyan Valley, Hazaraja, extraordinary transformation over 20 years. Other areas of the country, for example, the Sangin district in Helmand, very, very difficult. And in some ways, the lives of women in those communities didn't change as much as we would have liked over the period, partly because they were in the middle of a horrible conflict, drug wars, warlords, and ultimately a Taliban insurgency. On the second point that Dr. Orzala has made about small businesses, this is absolutely vital. And there's actually a great deal the international community can do to help. 
At the moment, there are nearly a million Afghan women working in the carpet industry. And that industry has amazing potential. You don't need to think about it as it might have been in the past as a place which was dominated by minimum wages and child labor. We were beginning uh, in the last couple of years to secure some very high value contracts for Afghan carpets, selling to big American and European buyers and suppliers, setting up good weaving workshops with good conditions for children and creches. And actually as Turkey and India moves out of the handmade carpet industry, that could be a huge uh, opportunity for Afghans to generate small and medium-sized enterprises. The problem is that the international community now is not putting any more investment. USAID said it's not gonna support the export industry anymore. Everybody's saying, we're just gonna think about humanitarian support, and this is classified as development support. And this will mean very unnecessarily and cruelly that these great export opportunities, these contracts that women have managed to secure with huge difficulty um, are now under threat from the international community itself often for quite unconvincing reasons to do with uh, unrealistic views of how they can leverage the Taliban. I think that's a great example when it comes to uh, questions we'll get to around the role of the international development community in Afghanistan. Um, some of the decisions being made are, are uh, hampering some potential progress here. Um, for example, in the carpet industry, really interesting. Um, I, I wanted to talk about um, the withdrawal and certainly make sure we talk about that before we look at the current state of the country in the future. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the dramatic collapse of the military and takeover by the Taliban really left the international community uncertain about not just the future of the country, but the future of intervention. And Rory, I know as you and I discussed the framing of this event, um, we wanted to talk not just about Afghanistan and its future, which is our main task, but also how this fits into a history of interventions. And, and that speaks to the spirit of the Yale Development Dialogues weaving in history. So um, can you expand on that, just kind of putting this into larger historical context? And then I'd love to see if our other panelists have additional thoughts. Yeah, so essentially Afghanistan was the last big intervention in a 20 year period of intervention, which started with Bosnia and Kosovo, which actually gave quite a lot of confidence to the international community because in Bosnia and Kosovo, Essentially, there was an intervention, it was largely peaceful, a war ended, there was no insurgency and progress was made. And that in a sense drove some of the uh, investment into Iraq and Afghanistan, which of course were the two later interventions. In the case of Afghanistan itself, there were three distinct phases. There was an initial phase of quite a light footprint, very few troops not doing very much. Then the international community got dragged into doing more and more and more because they felt that the situation 2001, 2005 was not satisfactory. And then they went back to a light footprint again. The, the issue, however, is that the lesson that will be taken from Afghanistan is not actually the points that Khaled or Dr. Orzola have made about how much was achieved. In the United States and in Europe, unfortunately, people are convincing themselves that nothing was achieved, that the whole thing was a mess. And I think probably the which is completely not true. I mean, for any of us who saw Afghanistan at the end of the Taliban period, the difference between then and 2021 was unbelievable. I mean, Kabul was a ghost town at the end of 2001. There was, you know, I, when I walked from Herat to Kabul, there was no electricity for 350 miles in 2001. I mean, it's a totally different country. But uh, we need to start rebuilding some confidence amongst the international community that something can be achieved. And it's about getting out of a black and white mindset. Of course, we've proved that you can't build a perfect nation under fire, but that doesn't mean that you can't do anything. That doesn't mean that the whole project of international development is a waste of time or there's nothing that you can do. Of course, there's corruption, there's waste. Right? But I think uh, Khaled really put his finger on it in putting that in context, explain, yes, those things happen, they don't just happen in Afghanistan, they happen in Sub-Saharan Africa, they happen in Myanmar, they happen in many places. And things can go wrong. But when things go wrong, when the Taliban takes over, don't conclude from that, that that is because all Afghans want a Taliban government. That's the other mistake that people are making. The Taliban didn't come into these towns with everybody waving flags saying, welcome the Taliban. Right? This is an armed jihadist group. They were not elected. And 
Afghans been fighting for 20 years and ultimately people chose not to commit suicide trying to fight the Taliban. But that doesn't mean that they've chosen the Taliban. And that doesn't mean that Afghans as a whole think that the last 20 years was a waste of time and they prefer the situation they have at the moment. Absolutely. Khalid or, or Salah, you want to jump in on that? Um, yeah, I second everything Rory said, including his, his, his last intervention on, on the, the differences in how intervention was done within provinces. You know, it, it also had to do a lot with winning hearts and minds. Uh, somehow military did not do what militaries do. You know, they went and uh, created parallel structures, dwarfing their uh, other institutions that were supposed to do aid work. You know, the US military spending in, in some years, 100 times more in, on development than USAID is, is going to uh, skew the whole, the whole um, uh, development agenda. And, and unfortunately, you know, the, the, uh, the size of the national budget was so small and so much was spent outside the budget that the government had a real problem, you know, showing a lit, uh, and increasing its lit legitimacy. You know, so these, these things, Really did uh, did have a have a role in how thing, things uh, played, and unfortunately, you know, when when you look at some of the lessons that come out of Afghanistan, it's not the first time. You know, if you look at aid effectiveness principles of what you should do and don't, and how you spend and what channels you use, and how the government could be a partner, unfortunately, not much has been learned. Uh, there is a lot of lessons that are reiterated from Afghanistan that should be learned. Uh, but then I'm, I'm not very optimistic about the behavior of these international institutions and, and learning those, those lessons from Afghanistan uh, for a hopefully you know, improved intervention in Afghanistan from now on or somewhere else. Orzala, anything to add in terms of uh, lessons that should have been learned to inform um, you know, yes, it had lessons from history been considered, perhaps um, things would have unfolded differently and or lessons that we should be taking now from, um, you know, the crisis that has unfolded to inform work moving forward. Thank you, Catherine. Adding to this that uh, have been mentioned, I think uh, Afghanistan, uh, in terms of um, many fields, whether international relations or even many other economics, whatever, particularly uh, including, I would say, uh, development studies field, I think is a case study uh, in all different ways. Um, so uh, in that sense, my hope and desire is to see all, you know, uh, educational institutions globally across the world in this developing world, but also in the developed world. They have to pick Afghanistan and study each and every project and program interventions. And there is a tremendous amount of lessons to be learned in all of it. I go about some general lessons learned because I'm sure I know Yale and the politics department and everything can get it sort of to higher up. I think one of the biggest lessons that the intervening forces need to learn is to stop investing on individuals. We started with making Karzai the most well-dressed man of the year. And we ended up with what we're calling him, I don't know, all kind of um, a man with all kinds of illnesses and schizophrenic and whatever. We started Ashraf Ghani with calling him the second thoughtful man. I don't know Mavza how to translate that back into English, but terrorist in chief, I looked up, looked up in Google, you know, he was- Second, second uh, cleverest man in the world, we said. Uh, something like that, right? So we call him the New York, the New York, uh, uh, New Yorker actually, call him the terrorist in chief. And then look at what happened, right? So stop investing on individuals when you intervene in a country, it will end up in a disaster as it did. The other biggest lesson, I think, to very go very broadly is the issue of donor dependency. The starvation that Ruri was mentioning before, the situation, the catastrophe that we are facing now, it's quite shocking, in fact, if you think about it. 
one in two people don't know when the, where the next food is coming from. And I, I literally witnessed that on a daily basis, dealing with my own uh, friends and relatives and colleagues. This is the depth of the, the crisis. You cannot put this all on a government or a failed government or one, one party. I think from United Nations to, to World Bank to all the donor conferences and fancy you know, reports and everything, everyone should question themselves why we led everything to this level of dependency. Yeah. And last but not least, one other part that I would like to go on is aggressive means always fail. The whole of war on terror was a failure. We have to note that. The whole mission was to go and smoke out, quote unquote, the, the terrorists. Guess what? The, those you call terrorists are <laughs> handed over back the whole country to on. We don't go into blaming the game here, but aggressive means Guantanamo Bay, drone attacks, night raids didn't work. And that's what we see. The Taliban are more aggressive today because of those. They are reacting against their actions that were taken against them. So I think these are key lessons that we need to sort of look into. Stopping here. Sorry, go ahead. One thing I would add is the international community being modest and humble with itself and with others about what it can achieve. One of, one of the problems is that when you're spending, and I, when I was Secretary of State for International Development, I felt this pressure. You're spending billions of dollars in somebody else's country. So there's a lot of pressure to tell the voters in Europe or the United States that we're going to transform everything. And you also are always showing off towards Afghans, telling them it's all gonna be great, we know what we're doing, we have best practice, capacity building, it's all gonna be amazing. It would be very helpful to, from the beginning, set more realistic expectations. The truth is the history of international development in a country with a lot of challenges like Afghanistan, and there's, as Hallett has pointed out, this was one of the poorest countries in the world in 2001. With a situation where many villages in 2001, there was only maybe one or two people in the whole village who could read or write, right? And it's almost impossible to know what the infant mortality rate was because there was no proper registration of births and deaths under the Taliban, but we know it was terrible, right? So, you're starting from that level to be very realistic with Afghans and with your own voters about what you can achieve. So instead of saying, we're going to create, and this is something we all did, British politicians did it, but Afghan politicians did it too. You know, Ashraf Ghani, I remember when I saw him at the beginning of 2002 saying, we're gonna create a gender sensitive, multi-ethnic centralized state based on democracy, human rights, rule of law, right? It's not very helpful, of course, maybe that's the long-term aim, but begin by saying our aim is over 10 or 20 years to make Afghanistan more prosperous, improve the schools, improve the clinics. It's gonna be slow, it's gonna take a lot of time. And by building that spirit, you're not going to get so many frustrated Afghans, you're not gonna get frustrated voters, you're not gonna get into this crazy, very American all or nothing mentality. You know, either we throw the entire US military at it or we do nothing at all. <laughs> this doesn't work domestically. If you were working with a, I don't know, a, a, a community in the United States with high unemployment, let's say a coal community in East Kentucky, you wouldn't think that it makes sense to say, we're gonna go and we're gonna fix everything and we're gonna do it by dumping, you know, hundred $100 billion on you. And then if it doesn't work out in 10 years, we're leaving. We've got an exit strategy and then we'll blame you. We'll say you're all cowardly and incompetent and corrupt and we're off. Right? Of course, the partnering is a very long patient process. And part of the thing we did is that Afghans became frustrated because we pretended to do things we couldn't do. Instead of being honest from the beginning that it was going to be messy, that it was going to be very long term and getting out. And I think also was wonderful on this. The, the ridiculous, you know, hero to villain thing that we did with the presidents, with President Karzai and President Ghani, right? Actually, in many ways, compared to presidents and much of the rest of the developing world, these were pretty good guys. The problem was that we would convince ourselves one moment that they were geniuses and saints, and then the next moment we all said that they were corrupt and incompetent. It's a crazy way of thinking about anything. Really powerful lessons being shared here. 
Um, we have some questions coming in and many of these questions are geared toward Afghanistan's future. So I wanna make sure we move in that direction. Um, but first, you know, some of this has been uh, brought up um, a crisis in terms of food security, hunger. Um, but uh, as we all know, three months now into Taliban rule, the country's really facing a humanitarian crisis from its economy to issues uh, related to hunger. Um, I just wanna hear from each of you sort of what are your top concerns when it comes to the state of the country now, and that will help us transition into the role the international development community can and should play and perhaps what they should stop doing. Um, so uh, as was mentioned earlier, before the Taliban takeover, the country received an enormous amount of foreign aid. Um, Orzala mentioned earlier this problem of, of donor dependency. Um, so perhaps that's something we can bring into the conversation as well. Like how did the country end up here? And it's not just, um, the very messy withdrawal, that is part of it, but there are other dynamics at play as well. So um, what are your top concerns uh, in terms of the crisis the country is facing now? And then we'll get into what the international development community can do. Maybe we'll start with Khaled. Yeah, absolutely. So just to put it in context, Afghanistan received 40% of, uh, compared to 40% of its GDP in, in, in aid. 50% of the government's budget was financed by donors and that meant you know in a budget where 75 percent of the uh, budget goes to operating you know salaries of police and teachers and civil service you know half of it was by by donors and everything the same amount was off budget you know so eight billion dollars suddenly it's like a tap turned off overnight it's going to create a massive problem it and it already has and on top of it you have a banking sector that you rely more and more not for lending normal banking because we had issues in that area but but for transfers so the meager savings that people had uh, equivalent to a few hundred dollars were stuck in banks that they could not uh, uh, access for for weeks it created a massive problem massive problem in urban centers which was already seeing higher levels of poverty levels than than uh, than rural uh, sectors because they were dependent more on, on on the government and other so my biggest concern is the the famine when in june and july i was still at the government we launched a, a, a humanitarian appeal with, with a joint one with the un because we were facing problems with drought, uh, problems with displacement and problems with COVID. The third wave of COVID was very harsh and it had meant that uh, 12 to 18 million people, uh, uh, half of the population then were at the risk of it. And now if you add on top of it, this sudden reduction or stoppage of, of aid, it's a, it's a huge catastrophe. My biggest concern is, is that I don't see, unfortunately, the urgency from uh, international organizations. Everybody is looking to the U.S. Treasury and U.S. Treasury does not either care or uh, answer or they're afraid of Biden because he does not want to hear Afghanistan's name, uh, to put it very bluntly. And uh, other international organizations, because they have powerful governors of, of the U.S. Uh, government sitting on their boards, they're all paralyzed. You know, the World Bank sits on the biggest trust fund in the world for Afghanistan, Afghanistan Reconstruction Trust Fund. You have to just convert the RN reconstruction into relief and, you know, re reprogram some of them. But it, it's not happening. My concern is taking time on this when we are approaching the winter is, is going to cause massive human suffering. Maybe something that we haven't seen at least not this century, maybe in the last 40, 50 years, uh, 30, uh, 35 uh, million people where UN is projecting 97% poverty by the end of this year, it's unheard of anywhere. And, you know, somebody who's worked in this field, I can tell you that these are not exaggerated numbers. 97% right? could be, could be uh, you know, the base case. It could get, get worse, worse than this. I think humanitarian aid needs to move fast. I, I think the international community, international do donors, the UN and the IFIs who've been engaged in Afghanistan, who've partnered, have to find a, a way around the US Treasury uh, uh, sanctions because those are not going to be lifted anytime soon. You know, if you are a realist, 
uh, you have to think that. But there are other ways, mechanisms through swapping and, and mechanisms through physical transfer of cash into the country to make sure that these programs go ahead. And talking of the gains, some of these uh, achievements that were made in Afghanistan were done in, in, in collaboration with international uh, agencies, but also NGOs, like the basic package of health services was all delivered through NGOs, the uh, yeah. community development councils by the uh, uh, subnational levels, you know, they could, you don't need to go through a Taliban administration, uh, a UN agency, for example, WHO could to take over the uh, coordination and invoicing and messaging oversight and mechanisms that was done by Ministry of Public Health, and you could still still do this. So my concern is humanitarian plus. Humanitarian plus, um, I mean, basic services of health and education and community development must flow. Otherwise, we will have uh, suffering at, at a large scale. I think just my last point, something that uh, Rory uh, alluded to in his opening points, you also have to understand Taliban. Leverages like this do not work on them. You are creating suffering for a lot of people. They don't care about it. You know, they could still rule with an iron fist for the next 20 years. And there is a limit to how much aid uh, could have a, have a role, you know. So please have look at my appeal to international community is look at the bigger picture, look at the suffering of a lot of people. And it's not just Afghanistan. It's going to haunt the whole the whole world. You know, Afghanistan, fortunately or unfortunately, will always be in headlines. You know, if you leave it like they have right now, they think it's the end of it. It's not. It's going to come back and bite uh, everyone. So many great points, and a couple things I want to return to in a moment, but I want to bring uh, Dr. Orzala in here. But um, you mentioned it was like turning the tap off overnight. And as you said, it's not just the foreign aid dollars, but the NGOs working on the ground, many of whom have pulled out their staff, are still trying to figure out how to engage. Um, one of the things I also appreciate, uh, Khalid, in addition to just outlining the crisis and the urgency, um, you mentioned that there are practical challenges, but also ways to um, find a way around sanctions. And I do hope we can kind of get into quite practically how does the international development community engage. But first, um, Dr. Rosala, I know you wanted to jump in just in terms of outlining where the country is now, and then we'll kind of move into where, where things are headed. Um, just to, to add in terms of, you know, humanitarian crisis, um, the, the urgency is, is critical as we mentioned it throughout the conversation here. But uh, I like the point uh, Khaled made regarding, you know, humanitarian plus because the goal here should not be to keep Afghanistan. Uh, we we have a, a saying in Afghanistan that serum, you know, that you go, you get L and go to doctor immediately, they put us an injection and a serum to you. We don't want our country, 38 million of people, to become, you know, dependent on the e aid and food. So yes feed people now because a, a terrible winter is on its way and people don't have enough to keep themselves warm, to keep them, their children and themselves fed. So this is immediate emergency. And I call not only on donors and organizations and government, but also on individuals. Anyone who knows someone in Afghanistan just should, all you need is a bank account and an ID from someone. Transfer some dollars, transfer your lunch money, just be on a diet for one day and get something, send something there because really everyone needs it. Even people, I'm telling this to the middle-class type of people, even people who had savings, they saved a lot of money for the future of their children, like you all will do the audience of this panel. It's all frozen in the accounts. They cannot take it out. So this is a kind of a human responsibility to all of us. The issue is that this should not be a long-term solution. The development assistance, the sustainability of getting people, Afghan people are entrepreneurs by, by nature. All they need is some means. So that should be really also critical to keep. You know, the, the development assistance, the development aid, the development of the economic development specifically is something that we have to think about longer term. I'll later probably come in a moment on the, on the sanctions, but stop here, thanks. Yeah, we'll return to that absolutely. And, and that kind of the point you just made kind of gets back to what Rory was saying in terms of small and medium enterprises, SMEs. But Rory, did you want to jump in? 
to start the conversation around sanctions, I think the first thing is that I think all of us agree that the international community should be generous towards Afghanistan now. That means getting humanitarian assistance in now, but it also means continuing development assistance, right? Not just emergency food aid, but the things that help the Afghan economy grow and help the Afghan economy support itself. Why is it not happening? It's not happening for a series of reasons. One of them, unfortunately, is there is a sense of emotional anger and humiliation from the international community. So when I say on Twitter, for example, please support Afghanistan, I get people tweeting back saying, nonsense stuff like they chose the Taliban it's their fault why should we help them now so we have to be honest with people about the fact that they're wrong in saying that Afghans chose the Taliban the other thing is that people believe or are trying to convince themselves particularly politicians that somehow this is going to give people leverage over the Taliban well this is again wrong it's wrong in many ways as Halid pointed out it just doesn't work Many of these Taliban fighters have been living in very tough conditions in refugee camps or almost in caves in the hills in some situation. They're not like Russian oligarchs. They don't want to go shopping in Fifth Avenue in Manhattan, right? So they're not primarily motivated by these questions around sanctions. But there's a bigger point, which is that actually it's morally wrong to starve the Afghan people, believing that by threatening to starve the Afghan people, you're going to somehow get political concessions out of the Taliban is totally immoral. Now, what does this mean practically? Practically, a lot of this is bureaucratic. This is, why is the money stopping? It's stopping often for small bureaucratic reasons. State Department has suddenly canceled a lot of its projects because they say they don't have enough staff on the ground to administer them. The European Union has canceled a lot of projects saying we don't do development anymore, we're now just gonna do humanitarian. USAID is trying to reprofile, right, which is a very complicated bureaucratic process where they're saying we don't want to support export industries like the carpet industry, but we're going to go into livelihoods. And then other people are saying, no, there are terrorists who are in the Afghan government. And that's the most dangerous thing of all, because people are beginning to say, no, but um, this is a sanctions people. Let's say you export a carpet. Let's say you pay 2% export tax and that export tax goes to the Afghan government and the Afghan government is a Taliban government and one of the ministers is a terrorist. Are you funding terrorists? If you buy petrol in the gas station and you pay sales tax and that money goes to the Afghan government and the Afghan government is the Taliban government and a member of the cabinet is a terrorist, are you funding terrorism? So the international community needs to be clear and practical and take a little bit of risk and make some decisions. And the decision has to be, be quick, be generous, and don't get caught up in these problems around sanctions. Thank you, Rory. We have a lot of questions coming in from the audience, but first I wanted to see if Orzala or Khaled wanted to respond to that at all. Otherwise, I definitely have some questions to turn to. Go ahead, Orzala. I just wanted to very briefly uh, reiterate on, on the sanction point that Rory has made, and then we can go to questions. My, my personal view on the sanction situation is that I would like to know about a country where sanction have achieved the goal that the country is trying to punish economically, those countries have achieved. And then I would say, yes, this is the best solution. I mean, emotions aside, everyone is angry and upset in one way or another. But here, it's not about me and what I lost. It's about 30 million people, 6 million of whom are living in Kabul, one of the most highly population concentrated uh, uh, cities in the country. And they just don't know what to do next. The urban poverty is as much deep and as much dangerous as the rural poverty. The rural is a little bit less in, at risk at this time because they have been like going through this poverty for a long, long time. But even people with as I said, small and medium sort of activities and enterprises are, are going into crisis. So the question has, there has to be a distinction between giving legitimacy to some actions that the Taliban government are taking, particularly their gender apartheid at the moment in terms of you know, complete discrimination against women. They have to really, and, and, and just to share with you, I mean, some, some sort of reflections from the ground uh, um, within the Taliban, within the Taliban younger generation forces, they themselves are not convinced, and I'm sure they are listening to me saying that they are not convinced with these actions of closing girls' education, because I'm sure their own sisters at home are not happy with this decision. 
if their sisters are living in, in Afghanistan at the moment, which I'm sure for some of them it's the case. If they are in the middle of their universities, they cannot attend the universities, they are also not confident. And they are already like somebody was sharing on social media a picture of a uh, drive through which shows girls going to school and immediately one of the young Taliban tweeted an Arabic and says, this is a rumors against the Taliban that girls are not letting uh, to go to school. Here, look, they are going to school. And that guy again corrected himself, says, no, this is primary school. These are not children. These are not secondary and high school and university students. Girls are still not going. So scholars, Islamic scholars from around the world called on Taliban and says, can you come into a conversation with us so that we can resolve this? My view is that the issue of girls' education is not related to international lobbying and advocacy. I think the people of Afghanistan themselves will manage their way to convince Taliban to, to, to move on from this very um, unlogical sort of step to, to keep girls away from education and to keep women away from work. Practically, sector by sector, there we see, we observe some flexibility. Health sector was first. They never had restrictions on doctors attending the clinics or nurses, but slowly vaccination, slowly others. So there has to be ongoing engagement. Dehumanization has not worked, will not work. So there has to be ongoing engagement. Sanctions from the global, from international point of view is completely problematic as an Afghan. I think it's extremely problematic and it, the harm of it will go to the average Afghan living in Zabal, Oruzgan, you know, Nuristan, Konar, everywhere in the country, uh, or Hazarajat, everywhere, basically. Uh, it will not affect the Taliban, it will not, because uh, let's not forget the, the role of illicit economy in the country. Uh, other second resources that are not on the record, but still feed very well this kind of government and systems and those in power. Orzala, I want to bring in one question from the audience for you, and you may have just touched on this, but in case there's anything to add, the question is, what is your outlook regarding women and girls under the Taliban? What is your biggest concern and any ideas for solutions? Uh, my outlook, uh, despite uh, going through a very, very harsh uh, situation at the moment in terms of, you know, women and girls education, and I have like hundreds of women and girls basically contacting me and I'm sure many other women leaders at what will be the next. I am personally optimistic that this will be very temporary and there will be changes in pressure on Taliban. Uh, I'm not necessarily talking only about international, international pressure should also be consistent, but national pressure is consistent on Taliban to come into terms in terms of allowing education, allowing women to work in, in different sectors mm -hmm. and even allowing women to work also in politics. So the concern, the biggest concern is to just see some countries, major countries with a lot of leverages and influences, try to just keep a close eye on all the actions of the Taliban at national level and just move on by legitimizing them. So there is a very narrow uh, sort of line here not, not to be crossed. Engage, yes, but not legitimize their actions so that they don't get overconfident by some of the wrongdoings that they do in terms of you know, moving forward. So continuous engagement is, is key to move forward. Concern is to see this falling down. Afghanistan should remain in conversations, but in a constructive, constructive conversations, not really something that will continue to divide us and rule us. Thank you. Thank you. So speaking of um, this concern of legitimizing, there's a question here, um, kind of broadening the lens in terms of the international community's future engagement with Afghanistan. Here's a question from our audience, building on some of what's been discussed, but just presenting another opportunity to revisit this. So the question is, I think the appetite for doing more development in Afghanistan is constrained not by the view that we failed in Afghanistan, but by the argument that offering development aid will legitimize the Taliban government or prop them up in some way. She goes on to say, development aid is never neutral. So how do we do it ethically in this context without being seen to or actually propping up the Taliban government? Rory? Well, th there's no easy answers to this and we need to be realistic about this. I mean, we can produce spin and obviously the principle needs to be to try to make sure that the development and humanitarian aid reaches ordinary Afghans and doesn't reach the Taliban government. But as I've tried to explain, nothing is ever quite that simple because if an NGO fills up their car at a gas station, 
they will pay sales tax on that and some of that will go to the Taliban government. And that is unfortunately true, not just in Afghanistan. It's true if you're doing humanitarian aid in South Sudan. It's true if you're doing humanitarian development aid almost anywhere around the world. You have to make difficult compromises with the government. The leverage, though, that we should be exercising over the Taliban government is around diplomatic recognition. And maybe you could say to them, look, we're going to provide a generous level of humanitarian and development support to the Afghan people. But if you want more than that, if you want diplomatic recognition, if you want more of these opportunities, these are the things you have to do. But don't use, as I keep saying, starving people as a way of trying to threaten the Taliban government. It's not going to work. They're not going to pay any attention. It hasn't worked anywhere in the world. It's a very, very mad thing to do. And remember, above all, what that will mean is if you do this, if the Taliban government finally goes in 20 years' time, Afghans will be very, very rightly angry with the international community. If you want to have a good relationship with Afghanistan, you're not going to achieve it by starving the people and pretending that by doing so, you're going to change the behavior of the Taliban. Thanks, Rory. And building on that question, there's another question here that I'd love for Khaled to jump in um, and answer. And the question is, are there practical ways the West can engage with the Taliban um, without invoking feelings of negotiating with terrorists? So kind of building on what, um, what Rory just responded to, but um, Khaled, I think you could respond to this specifically. I completely second Rory on this, this uh, part as well, but as, as he said, there are no easy, straightforward answers, but what's the alternative? The alternative of shutting them off and doing no engagement, you don't use any of the leverages that you have, you know, so then you also play into the hands of the hardliners within Taliban. And they would say, you know, these Westerners, these infidels, you know, you, they're never straight and uh, look what they've done. They would, you are providing a breeding ground for future generations of terrorists or even people who are angry, angry at the West of being betrayed. Uh, and, and left alone. So uh, I think engagement on uh, humanitarian plus should be a gateway for, for further discussions. I think they've, they've shown some willingness on discussions on, on, on girls' educations, for example, which is, which is a, a welcome um, um, improvement and development, but, but more sh should be done, but still. Um, I believe if there is the issue of going through the Taliban government and then financing going through them as a concern, there are ways. As I said earlier, you know, you have national programs, for example, the Citizen Charter or National Basic Package of Health Services. You just have to replace the government agency that used to do the oversight with another agency, well, probably UN. UN is, is engaging uh, uh, through them. So that, that, that's, a, that's a start. And uh, Taliban would want sustainability of their rule. Uh, a very angry population is not, uh, not very conducive for that. So they, they understand that. But then there is a limit to all of this. Uh, would, at what cost are we going to isolate Taliban? Uh, at, at the cost of 30 million people starving to death? Uh, I think it's it's not going to good, look good on the whole uh, Western idea of uh, freedom and, and, and human rights. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, you have to engage with them. And and, and as uh, Rory and Urzala have, have mentioned, we don't have to go far to, to see for an example of how isolation has not worked. You know, look at our neighboring Iran in the last 40 years, crippling sanctions you know for people who've been there you know hyperinflation but what has happened they've increased in their grasp and uh, on, on the system and, and population more i think abandoning discussions with the taliban might not be the right approach one other question i'd love to just squeeze in from the audience before coming to each of you with final thoughts um we've been talking about a lot about the west and interactions with afghanistan moving forward and there's a question about regional politics, neighboring countries, and larger powers like China and Russia. So I wonder if anyone would want to jump in on that question. Maybe I could uh, add a couple of points before Rory and Orzola uh, have their views. I think uh, 
uh, we have to study every neighbor, you know, Pakistan has one that said something that we haven't recognized enough as this is a Pakistan enabled invasion, you know, regardless of what issues we had in the government, we had an elected government, a democracy that was improving. Uh, it's it's better than, than what's happening right now, you know, so um they did not want an indian influence and they've got it i don't think they want a stable fully stable afghanistan either the status quo is the ideal situation for 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 isi and and, and pakistan to have in afghanistan you know you you have as long as it's contained uh, people who have a longer view in pakistan are worried and they they're worried that this fanaticism will spill over the borders and it already has with with the in Russia, it, it was a difficult uh, 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 situation. They wanted U.S. out of the region, but they also don't want the the extremism crossing the Amu River into the uh, Central Asian uh, in countries. With with China, you know, I I believe as long as it's it's contained in Afghanistan, they have access to the minerals and the. Uh, uh, lithium and copper and all that's a that's a win for them and and uh, for Iran as well you know I, I think they wanted uh, US uh, losing in Afghanistan mm, but they want stable right now they want stable borders so they could dump their uh, low quality fuel and other products that they cannot do anywhere else because of the sanctions uh, with Uzbekistan and others, as long as they have borders and uh, exports and that's contained in Afghanistan, that's fine. You know, so I, in a summary, not a lot of them mind the current situation as long as it's in Afghanistan and does not create bigger headaches. But that view might be a short term view, uh, the long term, uh, an unstable Afghanistan at the heart of Asia is not good for the whole uh, region, but also the whole world. Thank you, Halid. Uh, Rory, did you want to jump in on that quickly? Just, just uh, no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll leave you because you, you're heading towards the end, aren't you? You, you want to do some final comments? Yeah, if you don't mind, um, we do just have a couple minutes left. So maybe anything you want to note on that, we can get to. But um, I just want to, as we close, we've covered so much ground. And um, again, our task today was certainly to look at how we got here, um, the state of the country currently, but particularly Afghanistan's future. Um, and so I wonder, just in our last couple minutes here, and I hate to ask such a big question with only about 30 seconds left for each of you, but um, you know, you've all made so many great points. What's one thing you want to leave our audience with in terms of Afghanistan's future, a call to action specifically for the international development community, which we've discussed quite a bit. Um, maybe we'll uh, start with you, Orzala, and then we'll hear from Khaled and we'll close with Rory. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I hope to be able to, to say it in 30 seconds, but my personal message to the international development aid and to, to, to those who are willing to support and sponsor is to invest on the Afghanistan's young generation, provide them with scholarship opportunities now before it becomes too late, particularly girls I am working on a personal mission on this together with another Yale World Fellow. Uh, as we are at Yale University, I will say this, Lorna Solis, she's also a World Fellow and I'm hoping to get your support uh, for this mission, uh, starting with a small group of young Afghan girls and expanding it to larger one. The best way forward in the longer term is to invest on young generation scholarships across different themes and subjects, not a lot only social or political sciences, but very critical subjects for the future of the country. Thank you. Thank you. Khaled? Yeah, I, I think act now before six to nine months or even three to six months of wait would might be too late. Uh, but for for my fellow Afghans, you know, somebody who's, who's who's seen it, somebody who's been part of this government that has collapsed, somebody who sh uh, shares part of the blame, you know, I, I am a big critic of 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 myself as well. I think it's all hope is not lost. You know, we should use this to examine the the things that went wrong. 
if we have a better uh, opportunity in the future, what sort of democracy would be built? It's something that's built in the matter of the uh, West and copies it, or is, is there some modifications that we would want to do? Uh, I think the international community on development aid should also have lessons. You know, there were so many nitty gritty uh, uh, and details on aid that, that could have made better impact in the lives of people. I hope those lessons are, are, are learned. And when we intervene in Afghanistan or re-intervene or somewhere else, we, we, uh, we make better use of the tax dollars and that, that are paid. Thank you. Rory. Um, well, I think my final thing is be generous, be quick, have hope. And remember that when you're talking about hope, you're having hope in Afghans themselves. And I think Dr. Orison and Halid have been an extraordinary illustration of why the international community should be hopeful about Afghanistan. We've had two individuals speaking whose adult lives really have been dominated by the last 20 years. And what you're seeing in uh, what you've just witnessed is, remember, both Dr. Orison and Halid have been through incredible trauma. Their family, their friends, their entire lives have been turned upside down. And yet you can see they are talking with incredible grace, humility, thoughtfulness, objectivity. They're not putting their own self-interest forward. They're trying to frame constructive, positive solutions in an unbelievably difficult situation. And so that should really give us hope because that is, of course, what people like me love about Afghanistan. That's why the international community should believe in the future of Afghanistan. I love that. If we were all together in person, I know the audience would be applauding um, and I would as well. So thank you so much to our panelists for this conversation on Afghanistan's future. Uh, again, this conversation was part of a larger series, the Yale Development Dialogues, which will be continuing. So stay tuned. And thanks so much to our audience for tuning in. We'll see you next time.